So, again, something a little different. Um, I'm very grateful both to OEM in general and to Stefan in particular for inviting me to give this talk in particular because I'm going to talk a lot about the work that we do in the context of the Knowledge Center on Earth Observation, um, which has been around now for three years about. And really, this, is the, this request for this presentation is really the first opportunity I think I've had to really look back and think about everything that we've learnt in these three years. And so you get to see this, uh, uh, at least in my mind, in my brain, uh, uh, what, what, what we've uh, discovered, let's say, in, 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 in these first three years of work. So since this is an Earth observation uh, meeting, I'm going to start with something a little different, um, just to kind of get us uh, open-minded. <coughs> so. Uh, this is an image from our newest satellite, looking at our oldest satellite. Um, it's an image from Sentinel-2C uh, on the 20th of September, uh, and is in the course, of course, of when Sentinel-2C uh, was doing its lunar, ca lunar calibrations. Um, and I put by it this quote by Marcel Proust, uh, the real voyage of discovery consists not of seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And I think, from my perspective, we can think about that or interpret that from a number of different reasons, or a number of different ways. Um, of course, every time we launch a new satellite, we have a set of new eyes. Uh, as we launch new technologies, think of the Sentinel expansion missions and things like this, that will give us new perspectives and new opportunities to exploit data. But to me also, having the new eyes is also about kind of engaging with different user communities and different, uh, and, and thinking about how our Earth observation science competence as a community uh, can really serve these different communities, uh, the different user communities. And that's basically um, how I feel uh, of the, the work we've been doing in the last years, um, because although we've been supporting policy for a long time, this is really the first time that we have dedicated a fair amount of resources uh, to really s having this dialogue on a, on a consistent basis with uh, the different policy, uh, in my context, of course, with the different policy DGs of the Commission. And so back in 2000, uh, we started to think, actually, some of you may remember already in um, 2018, uh, sorry, not in 2000, in 2020, uh, but already back in 2018 and 2019 at the Joint Research Center, we had done uh, an overview of policy needs uh, for Earth observation. It was called the C for EC report, uh, looking at, in particular, how Copernicus could support um, the policy DGs. Um, and that kind of started to give us an idea of really the breadth of opportunity that there was, uh, you know, we ha always had in mind the CAP, we always had in mind Lulu CF, but in reality there was a lot more uh, uh, that could and perhaps should uh, have been done. And so that report was produced, it actually ended up also um, informing uh, a staff work working document that was published in 2019 on Copernicus requirements, and that helped then justify the resourcing, for example, of some of the new expansion missions and things like that. So there is a traceability, and I'm going to make that point several times in my presentation, through this fairly um, systematic collection of needs and requirements in the policy context and how we use that to drive the evolution of the space program and of uh, uh, Copernicus. So after we finished that exercise, you know, we were aware there's a, a a lot of products coming out. All of the Copernicus services were operational at that point. Uh, we had an increasing, as I said, set of policies that were becoming aware both at the EU level and in the context of international commitments, <coughs> for example, for um, the Rio conventions and, and the SDGs and, and uh, um, uh, a, lo a lot of other areas. And so in discussing with... Um, what was then DG Grow, what is now DG Defis, uh, we said, okay, we need to put in place a mechanism uh, that allows us to have this dialogue on a continuous basis uh, with the policy DGs uh, uh, of the of the Union of the Commission. 
And so we established this knowledge center on Earth observation. These knowledge centers, they already exist in a number of different areas. Um, there's one on disaster risk management, there's one on cancer, there's one on food security, there's one, so there's, there's about, I think about 10 of these knowledge centers. Um, and really the role of them is to provide inside the commission a kind of a central point to address a specific topic uh, and to inform policy on that uh, area. Um, the JRC is normally always one of the co-leads of these uh, uh, so that we provide the scientific uh, and technical support to that and then in partner with the lead policy DG. So in the case of the KCO, it's uh, DG DEFIS. <coughs> um, we have 15 policy DGs who basically signed up to be on our steering group. So uh, that really shows you again the breadth of all of the areas. Of course, there are the kind of usual suspects that you would anticipate, DG Environment, DG Clima, DG Agri, uh, but there are many more as well that in some cases maybe wouldn't be immediately obvious, like DG Home, DG, uh, um, DG Grove recently for more raw material work, so a lot, a lot of, of different DGs. <coughs> in the Knowledge Center, we have two core areas of work. Um, the first, which is what I'm mainly going to be talking about today, um, is uh, about policy uptake and coherence, so really ensuring an efficient and effective uptake of Earth observation in policy. The second is on um, mainstreaming research and innovation uh, on Earth observation uh, throughout the framework contract. I will mention at the end of this presentation the Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda on Earth Observation, which we published in May of this year, and it's actually the first Shriya for Earth Observation that has ever been published. That, the ambition there is to provide a longer-term vision on, on, on where research and innovation needs to go for, uh, uh, across the framework program. <coughs> and around these two pillars, you can see a number of the activities that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, uh, that kind of help us implement those. I should say, although the Knowledge Center is really focused on the policy DGs, we of course work through this process hand in hand with all of the entrusted entities in Copernicus and the partners such as the ESA and UMETSAT to make sure that what we're uh, in the dialogue with the DGs were kind of always involving the colleagues who are actually implementing these products and services. And then we try and find throughout the year opportunities to have open workshops where we consult and engage with a broader community. So every time we do one of these deep dive exercises, I'm going to discuss, we uh, engage with um, uh, the research community, industry, member states uh, uh, to get feedback on, on the work we're doing. <coughs> so I think the first point, and I will make a summary of kind of these main messages at the end, but the first point I want to convey is that we have seen a tremendous increase over the last years in the acknowledgement, uh, in, in particular through explicit referencing of Copernicus and Earth observation in European Union legislation. So what you see here is a bar chart of different areas of the European Green Deal and how many times Copernicus or Earth observation is referenced in separate pieces of legislative documents. So that's directives, regulations, communications, staff working documents over this period. And I can tell you until the end of, from the beginning of this financial period to the end of 23, there were about more than 50, I think around 55 references to Copernicus and Earth observation. That is basically an order of magnitude greater than in the previous uh, MFF. So I, I really feel we're a sea change at the moment in the um, appreciation of how and where Earth observation uh, um, should be used and referenced in, in, in legislation. <coughs> so that's till the end of 23. Of course, this hasn't stopped in 24, actually with some very substantial pieces of legislation um, uh, referencing uh, 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 Copernicus, um, 
uh, I think here I've got the Critical Raw Material Act, which I mentioned before, um, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions and removals for uh, Lulu CF, and uh, of course, the Nature Restoration Law. Um, and of course, there was the EUDR as well. Um, but if I can just focus for a minute on the Nature Restoration Law, and this is to make a second observation, which is that it's not only that there are more references to Copernicus and Earth observation in policy, but my feeling is this is becoming more and more prescriptive. It's perhaps not what as we as scientists would like to see yet, but it's definitely, you know, it's not just kind of a general reference on uh, you should take advantage of Earth observation data in implementing this policy. Here in the nature restoration law, uh, when we look at urban green spaces in particular, you can see that there are explicit references to, for example, how uh, earth observation should be used to calculate uh, uh, for urban green spaces, uh, calculated on the basis of data provided by the Copernicus Land Mon Monitoring Service and the Union Space Program. And of course, this is the primary legal text. So there will be implementing acts that go into more detail of what exactly that means and how that should be done. And, uh, but I think, as I said, the point I want to make with this is they're getting and they're understanding that they can be more and more prescriptive. Of course, this has happened already for several years in the cap, but I think we're seeing this now increasingly in, in many other areas of, of, of European legislation. So um, a couple of points on, on kind of standards, terminology, this actually, Peter Strobel would kill me if he saw this, but he's told me several times it's not a taxonomy, it's a typology, but okay, uh, as we know, Peter. Uh, so anyway, this is the typology, let's go with that, um, that we agreed at the very beginning of the Knowledge Center, uh, together with the policy DGs, would allow us to structure the work, the content, the knowledge that we are consolidating on a use of Earth observation. So that's kind of a first thing, and I'll make several other examples now, is, is we understood from early on we need to agree on some common language, some common uh, terms and, uh, and typology with them, uh, with, the, uh, with the policy DGs. And that has also gone forward now into something, uh, my colleague Dominic is here, um, and this is again something that Peter uh, Strobel is uh, helping us with is really we understood we had to establish a typology, uh, sorry, a glossary, both to, um, to interact with the policy DGs, so we were providing them consistent definitions of what we were asking them for as far as needs and requirements, uh, uh, but also in our dialogue with uh, our implementing partners. You'd be surprised if you look across the <laughs> Copernicus services that actually in different services they're using the same terms for different things, so, so we thought that was a, another good way of standardizing this across uh, services as well. And this glossary, it's mainly for our internal use, but we also wanted to put it online and give people the opportunity to comment uh, uh, and, uh, and come back on this. Peter uh, is also advancing this in the context of discussions in CIOS um, uh, so that we can also agree on this with our international partners. <coughs> Another point, uh, and this, in the next two slides, I'm going to kind of show some core principles, I would say, that we've come to in our uh, discussions with the policy DGs. The first is about the policy cycle and the sense that uh, I think m up to now, we have very much focused always on the use of Earth observation in policy implementation. So we have a law, we have uh, a monitoring requirement, and we're using Earth observation for that. But what we're increasingly trying to do in the dialogue with the policy DGs is trying to and explain to them that they should be taking advantage of Earth observation in reality all throughout the policy cycle. So from policy anticipation and, and, and formulation, for example, establishing baselines or uh, providing that historical perspective, uh, of course, to implementation, but all the way through to policy evaluation. And that is going to become key um, in, in the next years, I think. Uh, I didn't include any slides in this presentation on, um, on the next commission and uh, where we can expect things to go. 
uh, uh, of course, the hearings with the new commissioners are still going on, so, so we'll have to see how that plays out. Uh, but I think one thing that's clear to me is we probably won't see as much new legislation, especially in the environmental uh, 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 context, but there will be a lot of focus on actually putting that legislation in place and uh, uh, Earth observation will have to play a critical role in that. If, if you look through the mission letters that the President von der Leyen sent to all of the, new, uh, all of the uh, uh, potential commissioners, in each and every one of them there was this emphasis on implementation and simplification of legislation. And that's where we think Earth observation can also play a major role. The second kind of principle that, that uh, we, we adopt in this dialogue is really this idea of putting in place a systematic approach to basically reverse engineering the value chain. So we start by capturing their needs and requirements. Then we think about what applications are needed to support that, what are the data products, and ultimately what are the observations. This allows us to systematically assess the fitness for purpose of what they're asking us for all throughout that value chain. But also once we've identified gaps to then inform the evolution of the program, Copernicus in this case, uh, to how we address those needs uh, and, and address the remaining gaps through service evolution. If we still have a gap, maybe it's a ground segment aspect and on a longer time scale, it's the satellite. Um, and this is just some, uh, repeating that a bit, showing this kind of feedback between um, a focus on capturing the needs and applications they have an impact on the next generation of Earth observation products and services uh, and, and the satellites, of course, and then ultimately feeding back into kind of the, the future uh, policy evolutions. <clears throat> so a couple of words on, on, on the approaches and methods that, that we use. One uh, are these so-called deep dive assessments. And here we have kind of a stepwise approach where we have a, a co-design sessions with the policy DGs. Uh, we pick a topic, so the first one, for example, was on biodiversity, but it's not just DGM talking to us. We had DG Klima, DG Agri, DG Impa, DG Mare, and they're all coming together to kind of express their needs on that specific topic, for example, biodiversity. Once we've captured those needs, then we do our internal work translating those needs into uh, uh, more quantitative requirements, as I said, we do this value chain analysis, which is not only about the information flow, but it's also about identifying the stakeholders throughout the value chain uh, who could, uh, so that we make sure we have an implementation solution <coughs> afterwards. Um, and then what we do once we've done that, we assess the fitness for purpose of existing products and services, firstly inside Copernicus, then outside of Copernicus, maybe in research or from industry, uh, uh, and uh, until, we, uh, until we kind of um, come to a conclusion whether it's a remaining gap or whether it's something that could be filled by transitioning existing research, for example, into operations. And then we come up with a series of recommendations. So I'll, I'll go, I won't go into too much detail on these, all of these reports, but this just gives you an overview, for example, the one on biodiversity, which is already complete, and you can uh, download the, uh, uh, the report. We had a series of DGs involved, as I said. We analyzed a series of use cases that they proposed, and those are all the policies that those use cases are basically relating to as far as implementation. Um, we're just concluding now one on urban climate adaptation. Um, again, uh, you see the, the, the DGs involved and the use cases in the middle um, and, um, and the legislation that is related to those use cases. I think one interesting thing is basically in all of the deep dives, we've also had some more cross-cutting topics. In this case, on urban climate adaptation, the cross-cutting topics were looking at indicators, which we also looked at in biodiversity, and I'll come to that just now, and uh, uh, the Horizon Europe missions. As I said, indicators, to me, that's another message I want to pass, is that really is the, the, the interface, let's say, between what we would call a traditional Earth observation value chain and, um, and the policy needs often. Indicate, you know, legislation normally has targets. Those targets are assessed by looking at indicators. And so to have that traceability between that indicator definition and, um, 
and the um, and the policy need is a, a key uh, kind of interface that we should be looking at. And so we systematically look at these indicators for each use case we address. But the indicators, there's another aspect as we get more in this simplification uh, point of view is that in fact, many different legislations are asking for similar things, but they're just often defined slightly differently. And so there's kind of a, a semantic aspect. If we want to promote, as I said at the beginning, policy coherence as well, then what we should be looking at is how to interpret the different indicator requests that are depending on the same data sets in different legislation, and so that we can provide reference products that then can be translated into the specific indicator for that specific thing. And this will support, you'll hear time and time again in the next years, this issue of reporting burden. That will be another key way that we can help support this uh, reporting burden. Of course, the, the value chain I showed before is quite simplistic. Um, it, the truth is that what we call the last mile, so from our kind of output from our core services to what the policymaker is actually asking for, there's a lot of complexity in there. And we need to think of kind of a lot. This is um, a schematic from the deep dive on cl urban climate adaptation where we really had to go into detail on how do we build on the output from the core services to provide specific indicators uh, uh, that, that can uh, help address the policy needs. <coughs> um, a deep dive, another deep dive that's ongoing that should finish in the next uh, month or so is this one on compliance assurance. And I think this is extremely interesting because it's starting to look not at a specific thematic, but more, at, as I said, at how we support policy making in general rather than just supporting policy. Again, there are a number of use cases. Here we brought some new DGs in like DG Enna and DG Grow who hadn't been involved in the previous use cases. <coughs> and you can see there that um, a, a lot of additional and, and new topics but also uh, some other cross-cutting activities in this deep dive, looking at things that are specific to compliance assurance, such as the implications on compliance for uncertainty and veracity, and the legal constraints to using these products in, in, in court. <coughs> um, so those are the deep dives. Um, another area of work I mentioned at the very beginning that a lot of this kind of thinking and dialogue with the DG started back in 18 and 19 when we did that first report before the Knowledge Center was created. We're now updating that survey. We started before the summer. So here we're reaching out to all of these 15 DGs, going really at the unit level inside each DG and coming up uh, with uh, a set of policy files uh, that then they help we work with them to complete this survey so that we have kind of this broad overview of needs and requirements at the level of the commission. And there you see a timeline we expect to finish this and analyzing this data uh, by a, about quarter one of next year. <coughs> and this again could inform uh, requirement documents that then are used as we start to think of the evolution of the program in the next financial uh, period starting from uh, 27 or 28, sorry. So just to emphasize this point that I think we're going to see a transition, at least in the work that we do in the next years, away from looking at specific thematic areas, as we've done in some of the deep dives so far, to really looking more at these cross-cutting aspects. And here are just some examples. Compliance assurance, which we've already started, is one area. Um, and of course, all of the implications of interoperability of products and tools and indicators, as I mentioned before. I see that there's an increasing transition and also to the references in legislation of really using Earth Observation and Copernicus in strictly a monitoring context, more to kind of the R and the V of MRV. One thing I haven't mentioned so far that is also coming up is that there's a very strong interest from uh, Eurostat in making much more use of Earth Observation and official statistics, uh, and also the partner DGs uh, are interested in seeing that happen. Um, there was actually a Warsaw Declaration, I think, um, by the National Statistics Institutes uh, a couple of years ago where they were pushing uh, both themselves and the Commission to look more and more about how Earth observation uh, should be used in official statistics. And then the last, as I said, this is something we're getting a lot of um, 
pressure on at the moment is really to analyze how and where Earth observation can be help in reducing reporting burden, both from a point of view of the actual sampling burden itself, but also in, as I said before, establishing reference data sets that can be used across multiple legislation. <coughs> Maybe I won't go into too much detail on this, but just to point out that there is a big gap or a recurrent gap, um, which is, as I said before, this idea of these last mile policy applications from the end of the traditional kind of Earth observation value chain really to, to, to specific policy applications we're getting requests for. Um, and we are starting to analyze what, how to address this, what the mechanisms are. Um, maybe the one thing I'll flag there on the prototyping is uh, the last bullet, which is, this is my feeling and I don't have any ideas how we implement this or how we resource this yet, but I think we need something that is a kind of a, an Earth Observation Science Service, uh, uh, the European level, which when we get these policy needs, we can kind of consult with the science service uh, and try and understand what the state of the art can provide as a solution. <coughs> so we'll look into opportunities for how uh, we could resource such a thing, and it's obvious that communities such as OEM would play a major contribution to this. Another thing, and this is also a call out to, to Dominique again, uh, is we're doing as kind of supportive background work, a lot of effort in trying to map uh, resources that are contained in various databases. Uh, so for example, the research projects in Cordis, uh, the service portfolios uh, and product portfolios in Copernicus, and the EU legislation and policies in, in Eurlex and Decide, and our idea is really to be able to connect these different databases so that we can query it and ask things like which projects have transitioned in recent years into operational products in Copernicus, or how are both projects and operational pro uh, uh, products addressing specific policy needs. <coughs> um, please do talk with uh, uh, Dominic uh, if you want to get specific details on this. So now coming to... Uh, um, to, towards the end. Uh, first of all, I won't go into detail, but as I flagged before, we did produce this strategic research and innovation agenda. Please do have a look at this if you, if, if you want. <coughs> um, I started to think, and especially after I listened to the last two days of work, where the links are uh, with uh, the work you do in Open Earth Monitor. And of course, the what I've been mentioning on these last mile policy applications, a lot of the use cases that you've been developing, I think can address some of these gaps. I've mentioned to some of you when you've, I've heard your presentations that that was exactly the type of thing we were looking for when the specific policy G was asking it. I think we can really take advantage of a lot of the work you've been doing also on standards, but also help uh, use your products when we're doing our fitness for purpose assessments in the, in, in the deep dives. And then uh, there's an open offer, at least from my side, if you need to kind of create some publicity of the work you're doing also to the policy DGs too. Uh, we're happy to do that from the, um, uh, the KCO website. So very quickly, just to summarize, uh, these are my, also my main points, because as I said, this was an exercise for me as well. So there's a substantial increase in awareness and demand for the uptake of Earth observation. It's not only sectoral policy, but an also a new emphasis on policy aspects. There's a big transition now from monitoring to reporting and, and vegetation. Uh, and there's a fundamental need also in our dialogue with the policy DGs and users to uh, establish standards on language uh, terminology. <coughs> and finally, um, I'm still convinced the value chain is an effective way, but also allows us to justify the investments that we're making and asking for future investments in the future. But we need to recognize that our view of Earth observation value chains needs to be extended quite a bit as we're addressing specific policy needs. Um, we need to remain uh, state of the art uh, and continu do continuous research assessments. And I think we have a very strong Earth observation research community in Europe, uh, and we need to think about how we can sustain this really and, and kind of direct this uh, uh, to really help us address some of the gaps that we see in this. So thank you very much.